technical difficulties, um, but uh, this is a this uh, tasting is about uh, our Kill Hill wine, and so we're actually on Kill Hill. Hopefully, not uh, going to fall over. We're about here to roll down Kill Hill. <laughs> this is we we wanted one of the things that we wanted to show you guys um, why we thought we'd do it up here is we give you guys a little bit of a a little bit of a vantage uh, point for how steep the vineyard is, which is really hard to see when you're in the tasting room sometimes. It just, uh, but when you're up here, uh, you can really see um, see what we're dealing with here. So this is this is the corner of Kill Hill. Kill Hill, uh, Kill Hill is, is about two and a half acres. Uh, we've got, um, uh, it's split into two clones, 667 and uh, and the 114 clone. And it is easily the most difficult part of the vineyard and produces always the biggest the biggest wine of, of any Linnae wines. And a lot of people, uh, I would say if I polled our club members, uh, I would say somewhere around 60% would say that Kill Hill's their favorite wine. It's definitely a favorite um, because it is so big and it's it's balanced um, it's still Pinot balanced like a Pinot Noir but it's it's bigger it's it's heading more towards uh, you know almost crossing that bridge between Pinot Noir and Syrah some years especially in the warm years so we're gonna taste uh, we're gonna taste three different wines one of them is an older wine here and then uh, we're gonna taste the 2011 Kill Hill the 2017 Kill Hill and the 2018 Kill Hill, which we really haven't even put on the website, but but it is available. Uh, so before we get into that, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous day here. This is uh, almost summer-like here today. We're kind of in the mid 80s today. We're um, really enjoying the weather and really enjoying the fact that we think that uh, we're going to be opening pretty soon. Um, the uh, governor is uh, uh, starting to put counties into phase one of reopening, and each county has to submit a plan, and Yamhill County is going to submit their plan early in the week, and we may be open by Friday. Who knows? But if, if not uh, this next weekend, I think it's coming really soon. So I, I, I'd really be uh, shocked if we weren't open by Memorial Day. Uh, and we're going to have a whole... A whole um, whole protocol on our website to show you what we're doing to keep people safe while they're here and to keep the employees safe uh, while you're here and I, th I think that we can uh, manage that and, uh, and make you feel comfortable so anyway uh, that's something that's gonna ha start happening really soon and we are really excited it's it's uh, it's hard to be up here and not have uh, people visiting us so uh, this is more rosé weather right now, or I'm actually drinking a little bit of Chardonnay to start off with, just because I have to have something uh, a little bit refreshing. Uh, but perfect rosé weather. We actually have a rosé that's going to be bottled on Wednesday of next week. Uh, we'll post it on the website by next weekend. So um, it, it's really delightful. It's a it's beautiful kind of clean fruit driven kind of rosé. We always do a sanye with our rosé, and we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about it a lot more next week because I'm sure I'll be drinking some while we're we're going to make it. We're going to do a virtual tasting on pizza next week, and it's going to be a really instructional video on how to make pizza. It's really not very difficult. I'm going to lead you through every step of the way. I've made so much pizza in my life that uh, uh, and eaten so much pizza in my life, and and I want to kind of show everybody how easy it is to really do it. So we're going to give a, a good video by the by the oven next week. It'll either be with the big wood firing oven or a new little uh, wood fired oven that we, we just purchased. So it'll be a lot of fun. All right, but we're going to start talking about uh, Kill Hill. So this, we planted this in uh, 2004, 2005. It was done, well, it was really done over probably three years because we planted it. And then we had a lot of vines die, and then we replanted it again. Had more vines die, and we replanted it again. So it was a kind of a stage. It was basically survival of the fittest up here. This is the shallowest part, uh, shallowest soil in the entire vineyard. It's um, 
and like I say, it produces the most intense wine because these shallow soils, there's just not a lot for these uh, for these vines to live on. And so what happens is they uh, they end up producing very small, thick-skinned berries. And no more so in the entire vineyard, these are probably the smallest, thickest-skinned berries. And they really do give you these bigger, um, I, I won't say tannic in the sense of cottonmouth type tannin. I'll say that rich tannins in these wines, a lot of rich tannins up here on Kill Hill. And uh, if you could see, um, let's see if I should, this is, the, this is the hardest corner of the vineyard right here. This little area right here, um, we've got vines that are still struggling up here. I mean, they struggle every year. You can see that, that um, we've, we've basically, on this part of the vineyard, we've gotten rid of all the competition. In, in, uh, normally, we would leave a cover crop in one of these rows, and then we'd clean cultivate or get rid of all the weeds in the other row. Uh, but up in this particular section, we've actually clean cultivated the entire section because we don't want any competition. It's very... It's a really struggle. It's that fine balance between stressing a vine and pushing it over the edge. And so some years we really will we'll get close to pushing it over the edge and then we'll back off and we'll start reducing all the competition. We'll feed it a little bit with calcium, which uh, helps the vines uptake nitrogen. And, and it's, you know, some, some years this vineyard is just crying to be fed with calcium. And so we try to balance it. You know, we want a, a good, healthy vineyard, but we want to produce very intense wines. And those come from stress vineyards. So it's always a balancing act we're trying to do. This, uh, this part of the vineyard, when we first planted it, uh, I was on Old Blue, which is our, 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 our old tractor. We actually have two tractors here in newer one. But uh, Old Blue was new back then and uh, burned out a clutch trying to keep these, uh, keep these watered. So we had a kind of a unique uh, situation up here. We had uh, all these little vines and grow tubes. And I would pop the doors off on the tractor and put a 300-gallon tank behind me. And I would go down the rows with two spray wands hooked up to the, to the tank. And I'd drop them in the grow tubes and I'd just fill up the grow tubes and move to the next one and fill them up. It was maybe the longest summer of my life. Uh, it was really, really quite an intense, uh, that's really intense farming to do something like that. But, but I knew that these vines wouldn't survive if they didn't get some water. Uh, this, you know, Oregon's generally a place where you can throw vines in the ground in the springtime. And generally, they're going to survive until the fall, even without water, depending on the year, unless it's a brutally hot year. And probably that's more difficult now because we have had the warmer years. But back when we started this, you could you could do that. And most of the vineyard was done that way. We didn't irrigate um, really any part of the vineyard except this by hand because we had to to get them to survive. So a really interesting, very interesting kind of part of the vineyard. And we decided to plant two clones up here. And I wanted to do a blend of these two clones. We don't do a filled blend. Filled blends are when you keep the, uh, when you blend both clones together at the time of fermentation. We do it different. We keep uh, both clones separate, ferment them separately because not everything's going to make it into our kill hill. Our kill hill, we only produce 125 cases. And so, less, and some years less. Some, some years, years it's 75 cases. <laughs> exactly. So, so we really want to, we really want to make sure that we're putting that kind of the best quality into, into the vineyard. And, and you might see, I'm going to pan the camera a little bit so you can get a little feel for this. You'll see Eric here in a second, but you're going to see some trees. And that's where our spring is. So you can see the tasting room down there at the bottom. You can see Eric. Say hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. And then you can see that's your name. you can see those those uh, big high bushes. Well, they're they're bushes really. They look like trees. Anyway, uh, that's where we have a spring that's right kind of in the middle of Kill Hill. And you would think that that would help. You would would help uh, get some water up here, but it really doesn't. It's actually mushy right in here, in this little area next to the spring, the uh, first six rows. It's mushy for usually until about this time of year, and then it starts to dry out. And then this part of the vineyard is like moonscape. I mean, come July, it's like moonscape up here. It's cracked, it's parched. It just is, uh, it's very difficult uh, 
part of Oregon to grow grapes on, and, and that's why we love it. Um, so it's named Kill Hill, obviously, in tribute to the, uh, well, I'd say thousands of dead vines we had up here when we tried to plant it. So uh, a lot of young uh, young vine mortality up here, and so that's, that's where it... Uh, you know, we, we decided to, we had these two clones planted. I mean, it wasn't a plan from the beginning. I just thought, well, I want to plant 667 here. I want more 114. So we'll split that block, block and we'll plant these two these two clones. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really have a conception that we would blend those and make wine out of it. Uh, but after the first couple of years when I saw how difficult it was, I, I thought to myself, it's got to make great wine up there. So. So I thought, you know what, we'll make a wine, and I thought we got to call it Kill Hill because of the dead vines, and and that's how Kill Hill uh, came to be. A lot of visitors think it says, think it's, oh, you have Kill Bill. You're a Quentin Tarantino fan, and I say Steve claims he'd never heard of it. It was totally just an accident. Similar name. Are you secretly a huge Uma Thurman fan? Well, I do. I do like. I, I, I'm, that's not one of my favorite of his movies, but um, but I used to always just refer to it as Kill Hill because it was such a difficult part of the vineyard to get going and I just always called it Kill Hill and then then I thought well yeah let's make a wine let's blend those two clones together and uh, and call it Kill Hill so last part of the vineyard planted right so this is the last part of the vineyard planted you had uh, this tiny little strip of 114 just I think six rows of 114 and you decided to do how did you decide which two clones for up here well, I wanted more 114 and I wanted some 667 and so that's we had some this uh, two and a half acre plot left and so that's that's kind of how it panned out. Um, the, the other part, the reason why this was the last part of the vineyard to, to uh, be planted is because it's the most difficult part of the vineyard to be planted. Really tricky driving a tractor up here, especially down by the spring. So we actually had to before we started to plant this, we had to get um, some bulldozers up here and move a little bit of, uh, of dirt around, so we could be uh, so we could be somewhat safe on a tractor up here. And it's still really sketchy in the springtime. It's it's not a place that uh, I like to be up on a tractor. Uh, we do all of our spraying up here until till it dries out and it gets safe. We do it all with a little four wheeler and with a little spray attachment to the back of it. We don't take our tractor with the big 300 gallon tank up there. I mean, I did in the early days, but it was it was scary. It was scary coming up uh, through here. Uh, but we love it. We it's, it's really an interesting part of the vineyard and it produces a very intense, interesting wine. So the two clones we have in here, 667. 667 is a powerhouse clone. It's a big, deep, dark, black cherry type clone. It's, it's really, uh, that's what it's known for is power. And it, it really certainly adds power, especially when you put it in stressed soils to this particular blend. Then we have the 114. Again, we talked about the 114 clone in our single clone uh, uh, virtual tasting. Very red fruited, um, extremely red fruited. We always think of raspberries when I think of, of 114 floor. And it, it, you know, it gets more like black raspberries some years like the 2018 more like black raspberry but but I always think of dark raspberries when I think of this particular clone so we're gonna taste three wines uh, we have these wines on the on the website uh, we have a six-pack a special offering um, you know we brought out a 2011 and one of the things the way I think you should approach these virtual tastings with us is you don't have to have a the wine and follow along. Some of you love to do that, and and it's great because um, because I think you can kind of hear our perceptions and form your own perception of the wines. But it's also a maybe a, a you can use these virtual tastings to see if you might want to uh, you know if you think the wines are interesting enough that you might want to buy some. We really try to be tell it like it is here. I mean, if you know me, I'm I'm not going to pull any uh, you know tell you a wine's great if I don't think it's great. So everybody's palate's different, and I'm going to give you the exact straight scoop on on all of our wines from my perspective. And I'm going to tell you, uh, and this is a really good uh, good time to do that with the 2011 vintage because. We're going to offer, we're going to have a virtual clone uh, or a virtual tasting of the single clones for the 2011 in a couple weeks. 
I think that's after we do the pizza, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, uh, you'll get, you'll be able to. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a good perspective of the 2011. So I, I'm the type of person that when we get a wine to you, I want you to enjoy it. If I don't think you're going to enjoy it, I'm not. If you're not happy, I'm not happy. So I want to steer you to a, to the wines in a way that's completely transparent and upfront in my perception, and then you can form your own idea. So we're going to taste the 2011 first. And um, if you were to open this wine, you would definitely see a, a little bit of, like right around the edge of this wine, we get just a little bit of a tawny color. Because, I mean, this wine is, you know, uh, nine years old right now. And this is a very unusual vintage, the coldest vintage ever in Oregon. Uh, we picked this this up on November 1st, which is just insane. I mean, we haven't, we haven't even come close to that in any vintage uh, since. So no, November 1st was just a crazy, crazy time to, to be picking up here. But we got lucky because it was dry enough that we could get up in here. Uh, this is really a tough part of the vineyard to get up if it's uh, if it's wet. But that year it was dry enough. It was just a cold year. It started really late. We didn't have bud break till the end of May. Uh, we've got about 12 inches of growth on the vineyard right now. We, we, we had nothing until the end of May. Uh, so it started a month late and um, it just extended. Uh, when you start late like that and we had a pretty cool summer that year, uh, it was really difficult getting things right. But a lot of winemakers are fascinated about these wines right now. I, I am a little starting to become a little fascinated with them. I always thought it was the leanest, toughest vintage uh, and thought I'd never want to see another one like it. And, and I, I still think that. I don't, I don't want to see another vintage like 2011. But having said that, they are really interesting wines that will probably be longer lived than any wines, any vintage I've ever done. Uh, I don't think these wines... Are, I think these wines are maybe even five years from peaking right now. Uh, they're they're certainly getting more interesting and complex. They don't have the suppleness that I'm really looking for yet, and, and I'm not sure when that's going to come. I've seen another two, three years maybe. Although I've been drinking a lot of them because we're going to do these tastings, so I've been drinking a lot of them over the, the last couple of weeks, and they're definitely feeling – they're not – hard on your palate at all they're 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 juicy and mouth-watering they, they don't they don't have that silky suppleness but they have a little bit of that right now and um they're boy they're what they don't have in that they make up for complexity in the nose they're really interesting very spicy aromatic um really different type of nose what, what when you just smell these eric what do you get out of this nose i mean it's obviously different than I the get other that two mocha thing just immediately I mean, it's we we mention mocha a lot with our vineyard. You, you know, there's only we're a very small vineyard. Obviously, the wines are somewhat similar in some ways throughout, and we have a lot of mocha kind of chocolatey notes. I was curious to try this because I we had the eleven the Linez, we call it Linné, you know, L E N E Z in French, and that that was on our flight for a while, just case specials kind of clearing out the eleven of that, and it was getting towards I think kind of its optimal time. It was kind of a drink now, but this has got a ton of body left in it still. I mean, you're. I was kind of wondering, is this going to be a little bit soft? But it's kind of, it's a little bit, I don't see watery on the first taste. It's not big and rich on the first taste, but then it's got a lot of body. It's actually much better on the finish, I think. It's got a real mocha, kind of that chocolatey. I'm getting a little more of a cherry note than the, usually I get that raspberry, kind of that rockiness of kill. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So so I'm getting, I get kind of the same things. This definitely has a lot of, of aromatically, it's really different than the young wine. So where there is very fruit driven, this certainly has fruit, but it's got a lot of other secondary, what we call secondary aromatics to it. I mean, I get a little bit of, a little bit of uh, definitely a leather aromatic, like a saddle leather kind of aromatic to this wine. And and that's, you know, as, as, as our wines would age, you'll get that leather Maybe it's a little spicy too. Yeah, it's definitely some spicy. Tobacco leaf and some of that. It's a little bit of those cab notes. A little tobacco-y, a little spicy, um, and and again that leather, that that kind of glove or saddle aromatic. It's definitely in there, and that's what the older Pinots will get. So, I guess that for for those of you who are, uh, what would I do with this wine right now? Well, 
I would probably still age it for a couple of years, to be honest. Um, but it's a really fascinating drink in and of itself right now. If I were going to drink it right now, I'd probably have dinner with it and pair it with um, pair it with a nice cut of meat or something fatty. It's not it, the tannin is there. The tannin's adding body, but it's definitely still got firm acidity. Not not firm like mouth puckering acidity at all. It's more like mouth watering acidity. It's a nice kind of acidity to it. But I think that if you're, so if you if you were interested in a six pack, you might drink one and then you might save one. It's really a fascinating wine. We really price the six pack really evenly. Um, we, we, I still have, we still have about 40 cases mixed of mixed clones of the 2011 wines. And eventually we will bring them out in the taste room. My plan is to bring these all out in about two or three years. And assuming they get where I think they're going, I think they'll be, you know, we'll price them pretty aggressively. They'll be, they'll be uh, expensive wines. But, and, and again, it's, they're not going to be wines for everybody. It's, they're, they're um, complex, but they're not these big, rich, you know, I do think the richness, some of that richness is really going to come. And we're just going to wait that out in the taste room and we'll start releasing them when that richness does come. So for those of you who are... I didn't turn off all my notifications. So for those <laughs> of you who are really used to, you know, you, you, I mean, you know our wines are generally pretty, pretty rich wines. These, I would say, are on the leaner side right now. But they're not lean. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. They certainly are complex and interesting. And so I'm just trying to give you guys a, a, a very honest, upfront perspective. I mean, I've been drinking a bunch of them. I've been drinking the Eleanor's and the Jill's and the Karen's over the last week because I'm trying to get, get a feel for them coming up to these tastings. And they're fascinating vintage. I mean, a, a lot of wine people, like I say, they're just twitter pated about this vintage, a lot more so than I am. Um, but anyway, uh, take that for what it's worth. All right, now we're going to taste the 2007, and if you've listened to these, I'm sorry, 2017. Yeah. Oh That'll be interesting. I wish we had a 2007 <laughs> here. Oh my God, what a great vintage that turned <laughs> out to be. Did you even have a Kill Hill for that was like no the third year. Uh, so Kill Hill, the first year that we did Kill Hill was 2009. Yeah, that was our first year at Kill Hill, uh, and. Uh, had a 2009 Kill Hill recently, very intact, which really surprising to me. That was a really hot, hot, hot year, but they're delicious right now. All right, 2007. Uh, if, you, if you've 17, excuse me. If you've listened to these virtual tastings, you know how much I really am starting to love this vintage. Um, I just think they're so focused, pure wines, uh, and they're going to just age beautifully. These wines. Now here. I get a lot more vibrant fruit out of this wine. It's uh, it's not complex like the 11, but it's real. It's just classic Pinot Noir to me. Uh, it it just has that black kind of raspberry to it. Uh, I love the aromatics of it. It's got some of that mocha, um, and just really on a beautifully kind of long piercing finish on it so really really great vintage and especially for those of you who do sell our, our wines uh, I think you're just gonna be like super rewarded for the for laying these 17s down uh, they just keep, seem to be coming together a lot more I mean I, I was I really didn't think about these wines a year ago uh, I thought they were pretty simple and not very complex but boy they are they're just really gaining a lot of momentum uh, as they age Um, you mentioned the topsoil earlier. Uh, one thing I people we have that really cool thing in the front of our bar, the tasting room, where it's kind of like it was like an ant farm, but it shows the topsoil. So, and from what people, something it's like 18 inches deep up here, topsoil. It's about 36 down by the tasting room. But you mentioned yeah. with the bulldozers earlier. I wondered how that affected anything up here. Well, we had to we had to um, we had to move a little bit of dirt around, or else we couldn't drive on it. And so it probably uh, probably gave put more dirt in some places, more topsoil, and took it off of some other places. So some, some of the places up here really have extremely thin layer of topsoil here. So this was even more bumpy back in the day. It was. We had a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, a ridge in here that we had to smooth out a little bit because we couldn't really drive on it. It was dangerous to drive a tractor on it. 
And so we didn't do a lot of groundwork, but we did a little bit. It was like a day's, day's worth of groundwork, so it wasn't a whole lot. But it, it's, it's dangerous been, to sit in really a chair helped. up here today. It right? is, yeah. If we're, we leave back, we're going to go over it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're leaning back. Now, again, I'm going to tell you, that, you know, I'm going to really point out the 2017s, um, that the 2017 wines are, I won't call them these big, rich wines, and you'll if and a lot of you have them and you're drinking them and, and you know what I'm saying but they have this just focused kind of finish that and, and they kind of just stay on your palate and, and hit towards the end the, these wines I just know what's going to happen to them as they age they're they're just going to be fantastic and so the richness will come you know it's it's uh I just I can't stop drinking them right now they're they're just fascinating to me right now whereas like I say a year ago I would taste them and I would yeah I would sit with my half a glass and I'd be done with them so but now uh, they keep me wanting to come back for more and uh, is there another vintage that remind you of at this point in their age? they are somewhat similar to the 2014 vintage but they're they've just got this focus that's kind of uh, singular and maybe maybe a little bit like the seven vintage too which the seven vintage uh, started out leaner than these but really boy did they get amazing they're just beautiful rich just delicious rich velvety Pinot Noirs now uh, the the 17 wines are uh, you know they're still relatively firm in acidity even though it's a really hot vintage and we've talked about this vintage before that it was a very hot vintage but we had a uh, a ton of we just had a big big fruit set, so it slowed ripening down. And I I really kind of thought after we got them in the bottle, and and at first when I tasted them, I thought I thought these wines really suffered from the big fruit set. I thought that they their focus was kind of lacking. They didn't have a lot of uh, you know dimension underneath. They didn't have like any richness or and it just popped out of nowhere a couple months ago I, or maybe I just started to notice it because I haven't really been drinking a ton of them this last year but they, they really started to kind of tighten up it's almost like they've condensed or something in the bottle and gotten more uh, more condensed and focused and I, I love them I mean it's really uh, it's now again I love them if you like big rich wines you're going to like the the 18s better uh, at least now if I were to pop them out in, uh, you know five years well they're both going to be delicious in five years but you would see I think you would notice that what I'm saying about the 17s and how they're how they're going to age uh, so but this 17 I mean don't you get that pure fruit out of this wine it's just I'm really getting a ton of fruit out of it right now yeah you mentioned you know whatever, two weeks ago we did these, and you kept, you know, the laser beam thing, and that's all I think about now when I right. try these. Like, they got really, for my palate, I like, currently I would probably drink the 14 or 16s or even the, almost the 18s. I like that richer, a little bit hardier style, but these are very crisp and pure. I, I'm definitely, I'm aging my 17s, the ones I have yeah. at home. Although, actually, I opened a Jill's about a week and a half ago, and it was really nice. Yeah. But, yeah. So, I hadn't tried the 17 Kill Hill for a while, so getting it today, it's getting that, the one thing I talk to people a lot about in the tasting room is the minerality, is that rockiness. And this is that really rocky, as you mentioned here, our porous soil, very thin topsoil. And to me, usually even tasting them blind, the Kill Hill just really has this rocky, gravelly kind of minerality. I get that in the 18, actually, more than the 17 right now, even, which is weird. But, but these definitely, I mean, like Karen's, people, a lot of our customers will probably say the Karen's, the Pomard Cologne, is kind of our heaviest, earthiest, boldest. And you think the Kill Hill is heavier and bolder, but I, I mean, everyone's palates are varied on these. But the Karens, to me, is a little bit fruitier and kind of denser and richer in that way, a little more like viscous. And the Kill Hill, to me, is rockier and kind of gravelly and kind of like a little bit, I wouldn't say thinner exactly, but it's definitely, it's a little bit more pure in that style. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. So these are, you know, I used to call these wines brambly. Kill Hill, I used to say, oh, that's a big brambly kind of, um, kind of wine. And so... Uh, there's a certain roughness about Kill Hill uh, that you know a lot of people like. Obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, hands down, this is this is the preferred favorite of, of. I don't. It's not a single clone wines, but of 
that echelon of wine we do, and I lump the single clone wines in there, this is uh, certainly the one that people glob onto, and because it does have this this big brambly kind of character to it. Now, I actually prefer, you know, maybe some of the other single clones a little better. I mean, that's just my preference. I'm a real big fan of 115 and Pomard. But I understand why people love the Kill Hill. And if you like big wines, um, this is the wine for you. Now, I will say, I understand what Eric's saying. It's it's just, it's got a roughness about it, I guess, uh, is, is I think what he was kind of getting to. And I, had, I completely agree. It's got a roughness about it that some of the other single clones don't have. And some people really like that rustic uh, quality about it. Um, and I, I would say this 17... Again, let me, because I could sit and enjoy this wine tonight and be perfectly happy with it. I might prefer the Jills over it if I were or if I were drinking it tonight. But these 17s, for those of you that age our wines, and it's, I, I tell you, I don't, we'll see how long it takes. I mean, uh, again, you know, my general philosophy on aging our wines, and this is true of most Oregon Pinot Noirs, is that uh, they don't start getting that velvety richness till about, eight years out from the vintage and and I like drinking mine at 10 years out uh, some wines take longer this 2011 I think I'm gonna like drinking that uh, more like 15 years out from the vintage or you know 13 to 15 years out from the vintage so uh, I think there those wines will just be better and we'll have those wines we'll have the 11s around in the tasting room in three or four years uh, you can count on it because we I held them back because they just weren't drinkable early on uh, and so so we'll have some more going forward so, just to recap, for those of you who are drinking a wine tonight, I might go for I might go for our 16s, maybe. Yeah. Uh, the 16s, we still have a, a couple of 16s left in the taste room, drinking beautifully right now. Will they age? Yeah, one of my favorite vintages ever, yes. But I'll tell you what, the 17 vintage is just, every time I taste them, they're making me think. And that's really a good sign. Um, I think it's it's destined to be a really fantastic vintage. So for those of you who who have the patience at age Pinot Noir, uh, really think about these 17 wines across the board. They're they're just all really, I mean, from our $35 Linez wine up to our, well, we haven't released the 17 Saint Calou, but uh, be beautiful wines across the board. And all we right. still have all the 17s except for the uh, the Sad Jack. Yeah, 17s except for Sad Jack. We've got them all. All right, so now the 18, the 18, 18, big vintage, uh, ripe vintage. They're definitely on the riper side, certainly higher alcohol than the uh, 17 vintage. Just riper mouthfeel, softer, richer, uh, but with a lot of tan underlying tannin uh, in there as well. So they, they will age quite well. For those of you who like big, rich vintage, I mean, it's as simple as that. If you like big, rich vintage, 18's for you. Uh, they're they're fantastic. They're going to be, you know, I mean, we we you know these are really easy wines to sell. Uh, they they just sell themselves. We don't really you know you don't have to, to you know not that we do. I mean, we 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 give our opinions of the wine and and we try to tell tell you really how we feel about the wines and like I say when you're home with one of our wines we want you to really enjoy it and be happy with it and so we try to give as straight as we can about our perception of where the wines are and where they're heading um, I think the 18 is going to be around a long time uh, it certainly won't peak at 10 years out it'll probably take you know a little longer than that won't be as around as long as the 17s but they're they're boy I'll tell you they're they're for uh, for a lot of you, this is going to be a vintage that you're really gonna gonna love. Just that fruit on the first sniff, it's just it's almost jammy. I mean, it's just got that real, I would say brambly as well. But all the 18s across the board. We were joking a few weeks ago. Your 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 chosen adjective, Steve, is a little bit suspect for the 18s. He likes to call them slutty. So that's but they're voluptuous, they earthy. But really fruity. I mean, they're voluptuous is a much yeah. better word. <laughs> I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna quit calling them slutty. We're gonna call them voluptuous now, because <laughs> okay. that's that's a great a great term for it. Um, but the 18s, yeah, just that first sniff. I mean, the fruit just jumps out of the bottle. I mean, out of the glass. They're just really, really. They're they're not too heavy. They're not. 
I used to be really a really big fan of Zinfandels for years. My favorite wine. My dad still is a huge fan of Zins, and I've just gotten they're a little too fruity and kind of one note to me these days. I like a little more complexity and nuance. You mentioned that with the 17s, Stephen. The um, the uh, the minerality I mentioned. Good wine should have some tension, some disparate elements. Absolutely. If you get you know a four dollar bottle of wine at the store, it might be drinkable, but it's just going to have kind of one or two notes. It's not going to have earth and tannin and spice and fruit. It's just you can't get that at that kind of price point. When you get more premium wines, single vineyard wines like Linné, you get different notes, and as Steve really talks about, they really change over time. They can go from a little bit thinner to heavier to spicier to earthier to silkier. But you want all those little notes, and a good wine is like the first taste is not going to be like the finish. So the 17, to me, was a little bit lighter, a little bit thinner at the first taste, but then it got earthier and fuller and more of that fruit note. The 18 is almost exact opposite of that. Really big and rich and earthy at the start. And then it's kind of softer, a little bit more of a fine-grained tannin. But that's, it's also younger, of course, so that's the magic of... People are almost frustrated sometimes. They go, wine, it's always changing. I'm like, well, that's, that's, the, beauty, that's the beauty of it, right? But it's tough if you, don't, if you only have one bottle, when do I drink this? So that's, I think it's helpful having Steve talk about this stuff. He can really say how they're showing now. And we have actually mentioned on these from some viewer questions in the past. We're hoping to get, we're going to get on the website a little more of a drink now, drink later, save, etc. wines. Because it's we try them all the time, but you guys who don't have the, the luxury of working in our tasting room, of course we don't have that right now either, but soon, you can really get a sense of how they're evolving and changing over time. And that's really fun to try them at different, different kind of lifespans. Don't fall over, man. <laughs> yeah, I would really echo that. Um, just that note in general that... Uh, wines are dynamic, they're living, they're changing all the time, and um, they come alive sometimes when you least, least expect them to. So we've seen this time and uh, time, time out in the tasting room that, uh, you know, just one month everybody will be globbing onto a wine and it'll, it just changes. In a month's time, something happens to wine and just opens up and all of a sudden people see a part of the wine that they didn't see before because it wasn't uh, showing it, showing uh, that part. So, so you have to realize that with wine, you have to be, uh, I think with Pinot Noir, you have to be patient. Part of what, what I like to do is tell people that you can really underestimate vintages. Uh, generally, all the wines we've ever made here um, have all turned out great in the end. And I will say that the 2011s, I'm still waiting for that. Uh, and the 2017s, I know it's going to get there. Um, and the 2018s, you can drink them right now and, and love them, but they're also going to evolve and be delicious wines. They all get to a point with bottle age that uh, I've never not, uh, probably my least favorite vintage I've told you before was the 2009 vintage because it was an ultra, ultra ripe vintage. But yet, those wines, again, surprise me because they've, they've lasted 10 years now. And they're still intact, and they're actually drinking quite nicely right now, which uh, is really surprising to me. I, I could have never guessed that when we uh, first uh, came out with that vintage because they were so ultra ripe. All right. Well, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll answer them uh, best we can. And I, otherwise, I want to say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we really actually we're really enjoying doing these tastings and I'm really looking forward to next week's because um, I'm hoping my new little oven gets here I just ordered a we have a big wood burning oven that we built in 2008 and uh, but I just ordered a little uh, one of these little ovens because I want to show you how easy I mean pizza technology oven technology is has really come a long ways and so there's all these great little inexpensive pizza ovens out right now i mean you spend three hundred dollars to get a very efficient little uh wood burning pizza oven i i got a little bit more expensive model because i uh i wanted to use it to do some different things uh but we should have a lot of fun with that tasting and hopefully the rosé will be uh we'll be drinking some rosé while we're uh, making pizza for you and not it's not just about we're making pizza next week we're going to show you step by step i'm going to show you step by step how to make great pizza from flour from just from we're scratch. gonna we're gonna show you how to gonna give you a recipe very simple recipe we're gonna show you how to mix the dough up we're gonna show you how to form dough balls we're gonna show you how to 
<laughs> and then we're going to archive it so you can always, like you can make pizza you can go back and look at it and and it'll be uh you'll be great pizza makers uh believe me it's so easy you don't believe how easy it is so uh i'm really looking forward to that one that should be really a lot but if of fun. you want the best pizzas you need to join our wine club and come to our pickup there you parties go. Exactly. the ones that steve makes are be even better than yours though yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so for those of you uh, who are members, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, didn't mention, uh, especially uh, that we um, we do have members are receiving a little extra discount until it's going to go through the till we open. Up. Well, probably go through the end of the month, uh, or at least at least until we open up. We'll see. Um, but anyway, I think right now we have it on the website. Going through uh, May twentieth, we have. Uh, members get an extra five percent on anything you buy, and for you non-members, we have really some great, um, some great six packs on the on the website. Uh, we also have uh, any six bottles now ship free. We're giving you ten uh, percent on any six bottles, fifteen percent on a case. They all ship free, so and that's going to go th probably through the end of the month. So, um, and like Steve mentioned with the elevens, you can get those only as part of the package deals and. They'll yeah. be in the tasting room in a couple of years, and they'll cost a little more than they do now. So yeah, now's the, a really good chance to get those. The 11s will just be um, absolutely just on the uh, the site. Okay, so I'm going to try to see if I can answer a couple questions here. Um, yeah, you know, uh, so the 18, again, general, okay, w what I would say to you is the 17, somebody asked, what would you pair with these wines? The 17 Kill Hill it's one of the few, one of the wines here that would actually go with salmon, or you know, you could get away with it in salmon. Generally, our wines, you have to really pick the lighter versions of our wines to go with salmon. Uh, salmon is very salmon and orange pinot noir is a classic match, but I would want something on the higher acid wine. I would pair the 18 with. I might, I might pair the 11. Oh, I think the the 11 would be better. But I love the 11. So any other questions you can always um, you can always email us your questions and we'll answer them at the next virtual tasting if you'd like anyway I just want to thank you all for tuning in uh, we're really enjoying doing these I hope you're getting something out of them um, uh, like I say next week will be pizza and then you can check the website but I think we have the 2011 uh, single clone wines after that I may have it backward, good. but and no, then no, you're right, you're we're right. going to do a tasting where we compare three Russian or, or uh, we compare. I think the elevens are three weeks out. We're doing yeah, okay. around the world after the pizza. Okay, so we're doing we're doing after the pizza. We're doing a a, a tasting where we're going to pair a Russian River Pinot, a French Burgundy, and one of our Pinots, and we're going to talk about the differences in those areas and. Uh, we might even offer a six pack of those wines uh, on the website. I'm not sure if I can. We're we're trying to arrange that. If I can arrange it, we'll do it. Uh, but that should be a fun tasting. Give you some perspective on uh, on on different areas of the world. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Appreciate your comments, um, and uh, hope you'll tune in next week for pizza. All right. Bye now. And didn't save.